Hello everyone and thanks for uh, tuning into this uh, talk. Uh, my name is Sun Kevorkian from the Technical University of Denmark and I will be uh, talking a bit about the lifetime of organic solar cells uh, and we'll give you a bit of information on the status of the lifetime today and what predictions we can make for the near future. Um, so uh, to start with um, just recently there was a publication from an Australian group that discussed the levelized cost of electricity for organic solar cells. And what they discovered was that um, in principle even if you have already uh, something around 5% efficiency and about 5 years lifetime for organic solar cells, then they can become rather competitive uh, with other technologies in terms of uh, the cost of electricity. Um, so um, if we look into the uh, challenges today for the field, uh, that is the uh, efficiency, the upscaling and processing and the lifetime, then um, we can uh, rather confidently say that 5% efficiency is uh, achievable and we can already see rather many groups reporting on mini modules um, that do give up to 5% efficiencies. Um, so the question is then what is the lifetime and do we have enough uh, stability today for OPVs in order to meet this competitive level. And uh, this is what I will be talking today about. Um, so um, the problem with um, lifetime uh, for the OPV devices is that um, until today it had been uh, rather difficult to actually measure it correctly and uh, estimate what is the true lifetime of a device. And the reason is uh, partly because there were no really any standards uh, existing for this type of technologies for uh, assessing the lifetime and uh, partly also because it's a, such a complex structure and there are no really standards for the architecture of the device uh, it becomes tricky to really understand what would be the, um, the marker for defining a lifetime for the device and what conditions would be necessary for testing it and identifying the lifetime. Um, now, um, in, in 2011, we uh, tried to conduct uh, a round-robin experiment where we sent a large number of samples to different groups uh, and we asked them to um, test uh, those samples uh, in a conditions that do, they would usually use for um, measuring their own devices. And, uh, and then we received the results and started comparing them. And what we've discovered was that the, the results um, really varied very much from each other. And the reason was because um, the, instrumentation, uh, the instrumentation was uh, rather different from group to, uh, to another group. Uh, the conditions they used to, for testing like the temperature of the samples or um, the humidity level or um, the, the light source and so on were different which resulted in completely different lifetime reports for the same type of devices. And that showed the challenge of uh, how we can really um, do the, uh, the, the harmonized measurements. And this has been uh, addressed many times in the uh, International Symposium uh, for Organic Photovoltaic Stability. And um, in the same year, in 2011, um, these ISOs guidelines were published, which offered a, a more um, controlled uh, way of doing the tests under different conditions, um, both for uh, dark measurements, for indoor weathering, for outdoor tests and for some temperature cycling tests. And um, the idea behind those guidelines were that the, they first of all suggested limiting the type of the instrumentation that could be used uh, for the measurements. Um, but also there were certain temperatures that should have been kept for uh, the samples uh, during the exposure to light or even uh, keeping in the dark. 
so and and uh, and these types of um, of uh, certain values in other parameters, and um, this uh, I think helped a lot because when we try to repeat the same test that we did before by sending samples to other groups, uh, we discovered that if this time people followed the ISOs protocols or the guidelines, then the uh, reported um, aging curves overlap quite nicely and uh, the, the spread among the lifetime reports was much less. So certainly ISO's um, guidelines um, um, and targeted and, and uh, solved this issue of um, large spread among the groups. But then there were uh, still some uh, questions remaining uh, that uh, the ISIS guidelines could not really address. And that is, uh, first of all, we have this large cluster of pre-ISOS data um, that has been reported uh, that uh, we could somehow try and use um, and uh, how to use it. Um, also, um, how to compare really different curves and identify the lifetime for different curves. Because um, since we have such a complex um, device structures, uh, there's uh, a number of failing mechanisms taking place at the same time during the aging process. And this often results in uh, quite diverse shapes of aging curves for the performance of the device. As you see on the screen, I have put a number of them as an example. So um, the challenge is how to really identify a lifetime for this kind of different shapes of curves. And finally, another challenge is how to predict the lifetime because we certainly need to learn a way of, um, of um, confidently predicting the lifetime of 10 to 20 years by some accelerated measurements because we don't want to wait 10 to 20 years to report a stable product. Um, so today I'll uh, try and give some of the answers uh, to some extent and the way uh, I will do it, I'll describe you uh, the two projects that we uh, made earlier. One was um, conducted uh, in 2013 and one uh, last year. So the idea is we decided to take all the reports, all the articles that, uh, that deal with a lifetime of organic solar cells and scan those through and identify the, the data there um, and collect it into one common database. Um, so in 2000, 2013 we uh, searched uh, Web of Knowledge and identified about 2500 articles that were related to OPV lifetime. And um, out of those, only about 12% uh, uh, had actual data reported and the remainder were just talking, mentioning a lifetime, uh, but not providing any data. Now, similarly, uh, for, the, for, for the years after, for, from 2013 to middle of 2015, uh, we did the same analysis and again we found up to almost 2,500 articles and um, out of those again about 300 uh, articles or around 12-13% uh, had some um, data, uh, lifetime data reported. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, actually the, within the last two years it was the same uh, approximately the same number of articles reported for lifetime compared to all the years before which shows uh, how much the lifetime issue has become, became important in the field. So we um, collected all this, um, all this lifetime data that was reported in literature into one common database. And then um, the question was um, how to try and identify the, the, um, the lifetime for each of the reported curves. Uh, as I mentioned, they could have had uh, different shapes. So first of all, um, let me just uh, mention what is a lifetime. Uh, of course, commonly we all know that lifetime is referred to the, 20, the time when the sample degrades to 20% or uh, degrades by 20% from the initial performance. Um, this is of course a very uh, general uh, determination, but it is, uh, I think, very important also when you, we are talking about lifetime to mention also the, uh, the initial performance of the device because 
often uh, we see uh, samples which have a strong burning, uh, which is the rapid uh, degradation and then uh, followed by a stabilized phase of the uh, performance. And um, it of course can be that it uh, burns down to almost zero or a very low performance before stabilizing and then if you report only the lifetime then we don't know the efficiency and it's hard to compare such sample to another one which uh, probably degraded a bit faster but had much higher efficiency and that's why the energy of the other one was uh, much more. And that is why I think it's a um, good point to try and use a pair of uh, parameters instead of just lifetime um, uh, and, and use both initial performance and the lifetime together to, to um, talk about uh, stability performance of uh, OPV device. Now, um, so how, how do we try and uh, identify this pair um, for different shapes? And if you look at the plots here, on the left side you see a number of uh, curves with different shapes. And let's start with number one, the black one. Uh, what the ISOS guidelines suggest us is to try and use two pairs. Uh, so one is the initial performance, uh, which is uh, uh, so uh, the, the starting point of the performance and then the lifetime of 20% degradation, uh, which is E0 and T80. And then to identify another spot where uh, the sample goes into more stabilized phase, like you see here on the curve number one, um, or the red dot and define it as ES or the second start uh, and then define uh, the lifetime for this stabilized space counting 20% degradation from ES. Um, so those are two pairs that could uh, very nicely describe the lifetime of such a curve. Um, now if we look to, uh, into the curve number two then you see that it degrades much faster and it actually degrades before stabilizing. And in that case, of course, we do not have the second uh, pair which describes the stabilized phase. And that's why we use only E0 T80. Or the, I will call it the initial pair and then for the stabilized phase, I will call it the stabilized pair. Um, now, if we look, for example, at the uh, curve number three, you see that uh, the, the performance goes up initially and then starts degrading. And this is often because uh, samples need some uh, soaking um, to come to the optimal performance. In that case, uh, we decided to move the scale and put the starting point at the maximum performance, and then it would from then on be similar to curve number one and we would treat it similarly. Um, in the case when the sample would not reach 20% uh, threshold, like for example the curves four and five, then uh, we would not do any extrapolation because extrapolation uh, brings in uh, variance, uh, large uncertainty. Um, and that is why we decide just to use the T-final, which is the last measurement of, the, um, of this test as, as the lifetime. Um, so this, those were the uh, criteria for us to use um, uh, to, to identify the lifetime for different curves. Now, um, the question then is, we, we still wanted to have one unique pair for describing the lifetime and how to choose that pair among the two if we have both initial and the stabilized phases. And if you look to the right side, then you see again the, cur uh, the typical cur curve with the uh, fast aging and um, more stabilized phase. Now, the first part um, uh, the fr uh, is, is um, sorry, the, um, the gray parts are identifying the area under those um, uh, two parts. And what we decided was that we will simply take the pair that has the largest um, area, um, and that is uh, more or less the product of the two. Uh, the, E0 times T80 or ES times TS80 and that is in principle uh, the, the phase where the sample produces most amount of energy and that would be the, the, the pair that we would use to describe the lifetime. So this allowed us to uh, really um, choose one unique 
pair to describe the lifetime for all the data that we collected from the literature. And uh, after doing that, we put them all together into one plot and we first plotted this per uh, year. Here what you see is on the uh, y-axis you have the lifetime, on x-axis you have the year, and all the green triangles are the samples tested on the light and the blue circles are the shelf life tests or the dark tests. And um, the black solid line shows the number of uh, samples reported per each year. And as you see, both the number of reports and the lifetime are growing rather rapidly uh, uh, for the last several years. And today we have up to two years of lifetime reported. And this is very promising. Um, as you see, um, uh, it's a very rapid increase. So hopefully uh, some will have quite a nice numbers. Um, another way that we collected all this data into one plot was um, the so-called O-diagram. Um, now, O-diagram is in principle just uh, y-axis efficiency, x-axis uh, time. But what we tried to do is the, the time was, uh, the scale was for the time was chosen uh, with the base 4 exponential, uh, with base 4. Uh, sorry, logarithmic with base 4. Uh, and the reason we did that, you see here on the, the lower histogram, um, the logarithmic scale with base 4. Uh, and the reason it was done so because we could uh, link this to the common time units. Uh, the upper plot you see uh, words like hours, days, weeks, and that is uh, because we could uh, fit this uh, to these time blocks uh, of each uh, um, exponential uh, value and um, and this allowed us to really categorize the lifetime in a, in a more accessible more easy understandable uh, time blocks for ourselves um, and here you see also on the left the histogram for the efficiencies as you see most of the data that was reported in literature was uh, ranging from uh, 1 to 4 percent and that is because mostly P3HT PCBM was used and uh, we know that P3HT maximum gives around 4 5 percent. Um, and you see on the lower um, uh, histogram that the maximum uh, of the lifetime is clustering between uh, uh, hours to months and very few are reported uh, lasting up to years. So this was the old diagram that we decided to use uh, for treating our data uh, in a more depth. And uh, one of the ways we um, analyzed the data was we wanted to understand the difference between normal uh, structures against inverted structures. Just to remind you, so typically normal is called the samples where you have the anode as transparent electrodes uh, in front and the cathode, the non-transparent electrode on the back side, which is typically aluminum. And in inverted structures, you have this uh, vice versa, and you have on the back side anode, which is typically silver or uh, gold. And because aluminum is more reactive metal, it is commonly believed that uh, normal structures are, are less stable than inverted structures, and people tend to use uh, inverted structures. Um, now, there have been some debate about this and we try to, uh, to filter the data uh, to understand really um, where do uh, lifetimes uh, fall uh, depending on the structure. Here what you see um, is uh, we have uh, unencapsulated samples. On the left side we have the old diagram for um, dark measurements and on the right side for light measurements, samples exposed to light. Uh, the upper plots. The lower plots are again the histograms but shown more in the in shape of curves rather than columns. Um, now um, the red is inverted uh, samples, blue is uh, normal samples and then the open blue squares are actually the samples where the cathode is directly deposited on the active layer without any intermediate layer. So what we see for uh, dark measurements is that clearly the inverted structures are more stable. They lean towards um, months and seasons while uh, normal structures degrade within maximum weeks. 
Um, but if we go into the light exposure test, then we can see that, um, that both structures actually overlap or even uh, normal structures a bit outperform the uh, inverted structures. Now, um, this, this, the reason behind this is uh, simple, uh, maybe, uh, because obviously aluminum reacts with water and in a dark environment, uh, humidity is quite high and that's why aluminum reacts uh, with humidity and degrades much faster, while in inverted structures we have silver and that doesn't react uh, with water and it's more stable. While under light exposure, uh, the environment is more dry uh, because light heats up the samples and that is why humidity seems not to be uh, of much of a problem. But we've, uh, uh, there have been some reports earlier showing that actually silver is not very good encapsulant in terms of oxygen diffusion. So in inverted structures, oxygen diffusion is much faster and that's why we believe that um, once the samples are exposed to light, uh, sample becomes more sensitive for photodegradation uh, compared to the normal structures with aluminum. And that's why we see this uh, feature. If we look into encapsulated samples, then both structures overlap quite well, uh, which is because we simply protect the sample from both humidity and oxygen, and that is why those effects become less relevant. Now, the question still stands whether on long term for encapsulated samples, normal or inverted structures would be more stable. But I have to raise this um, question about what would be our architecture at the end uh, when, we, uh, when we make a product. Um, because typically in lab scale, what we see is a glass uh, substrate and device built on a glass substrate and covered with some uh, um, metal electrode on top. Uh, so, so the structure is very non-symmetric uh, because the sample is protected by glass from one side or any other substrate and with metal electrode on the top side and that's why when it's exposed to environment then the top electrode becomes the defining point for the lifetime. But obviously at the end uh, we'll have a product with some symmetric packaging, uh, typically sandwiching between plastics and that means uh, both the front and the uh, back sides will be uh, symmetrically vulnerable for uh, environment and that is that that's why um, the the idea of normal against inverted becomes uh, somewhat confusing in that perspective um, now if we move on um, we also uh, looked a bit about uh, into the pdot story because pdot is also debatedly uh, bad for um, stability and we uh, try to assemble the samples with p-dot against samples without p-dot. Uh, typically uh, metal oxides are used instead of p-dot. And again on here you see the same curves uh, for uh, dark and light measurements and the blue is p-dot with the normal structure and um, red is p-dot with inverted structure and then the green ones are p-dot free samples. Um, just to remind you, p-dot PSS is used as an intermediate layer for typically whole transport layer uh, and has a lot of um, good features for easy processing and protects uh, the device from shunts because it smooths out the uh, um, roughness of the electrodes and so on. Um, now, as you see from the plots, obviously the green um, is uh, more stable and that means certainly both for dark and light, P-dot seems to be bad uh, for devices. Now, there have been also some reports where it was claimed that P-dot is better than uh, metal oxides, uh, but if we look into those publications, they typically talk about encapsulated samples. And if here we look at the encapsulated samples, we again see a nice overlap for all the samples. So um, obviously within these short periods of measurements of up to months or maybe years, uh, we cannot clearly see the effect of p-dot. But uh, obviously um, uh, on the longer run, we'll see that p-dot uh, is bad for um, device performance. Uh, that is why um, it's, uh, it's a good idea to uh, eliminate p-dot from the structure. 
Um, now, um, another way we utilized all this um, data uh, in the database is we tried to create some kind of baselines of stability for our organic solid cells measured under different conditions. Um, what you see here, um, let, let me just walk you through this. First of all, now you see all the plots on the left side are encapsulated samples and on the right side are unencapsulated samples. Um, let's start with unencapsulated samples on the right. What you see on the top is group 2 samples, which is all the unencapsulated samples measured on the dark. And you see um, there are two red marks highlighting the maximum for the data distribution. This is the number of the data for each time block. Um, so two, two maximums correspond to the normal and inverted structures. Um, and as you see for normal structures, the most of the samples have shown lifetime of days in the dark and for in, in, uh, inverted structures up to months lifetime. The green marks the maximum, uh, which is about seasons um, for, for these kind of samples uh, in the dark. Uh, after, on the light exposure instead, the samples degrade much, much faster and it's uh, even not hours but minutes um, for most of the samples. Although um, very few samples have been reported to last up to months. Um, for encapsulated samples, um, group 4 is again uh, dark measurements and in this case the samples last again up to months. Um, um, in most cases and very few have been reported to last up to years. Now group 3, which is the encapsulated samples uh, exposed to light, has been split to three types. Indoor weathering under um, light spectrum corresponding to AM1.5. Um, um, uh, samples that have been tested outdoors and samples that have been tested under low UV light. Um, and in that case, you see for uh, indoor weathering with full spectrum, the samples last up to weeks in most cases, and the maximum has been reported somewhere uh, seasons. For outdoors, the maximum is somewhere in months, and a few have been reported to last up to years. And then uh, for, um, for um, low light tests, uh, most of the samples last somewhere in months, seasons, and uh, a few have been reported to last up to years. Now, how can you use these baselines? Um, the idea here is that if you make a new device and you want to understand whether you got an improvement in a lifetime, you compare it to, this, to those baselines. And if the lifetime falls, or if the lifetime is beyond the, med uh, the median, uh, the red uh, columns here, then you have an improvement of the lifetime. If it falls somewhere in the green zone, then you have an outstanding lifetime. And, and if it's beyond the green, green zone, then you have a record lifetime. So this is a way you could compare your sample to, um, to most of the other samples that have been reported in literature so far. We also uh, created this lifetime progress diagram, uh, which is um, which is basically the best reports per year for uh, samples tested under four different conditions. So shelf life, low UV light tests, outdoors and indoor weathering measurements. And you see uh, for outdoor and shelf life measurements, we have already um, more than two years lifetime reported uh, for the last year. Uh, while for uh, indoor weathering, it's up to 250 days maximum that has been reported in 2013. Um, so um, this, this also this plot is uploaded on uh, plasticwatervoltaics.org website, so you can go in and see the data. And if you have anything that you wanted to get on this plot, you're welcome to contact me and we can uh, discuss this opportunity. Um, so with these studies, we answered to the question um, how we can compare the lifetime for different shapes of the curves and how to use all the pre-ISOS data that is available there. But the question still remained how to predict the lifetime. And um, I think unfortunately today, I do not have a complete answer of 
how we can really accurately predict a lifetime. We, but I can give you a hint on an idea we have. Um, recently what we did is we used O diagram to compare the sample lifetime test it under different ISIS conditions. Now, the ISIS conditions, some of them are, are much harsher and some are more moderate. And that's why, obviously, if you test the samples in those, you will have different range of lifetimes. And for example, what you see here, if we look at the blue uh, labels, which are encapsulated samples, uh, you see for L3, ISIS L3 and ISIS L2, which are indoor weathering tests. The samples fall somewhere between days to uh, weeks and for outdoor measurements, which is O1 and the bottom, the samples go up to months and seasons. Um, I'm sorry, weeks and months. And in that sense, we can, um, we can uh, kind of assume that if we have um, accelerated measurements of ISOS L3 where the samples fall in the range of days and weeks, then we can safely assume that they might last up to months uh, in outdoor conditions. Um, this is of course something that still needs a lot of testing. We need a lot of data to, uh, to develop this uh, more. And of course, we have to take bear in mind that one is not really an acceleration of the other. So ISO cell 3 is not an acceleration of outdoor measurements completely. Uh, but the idea is if we use the entire matrix, if we use all the kinds of measurements and we generate the links, then eventually we can maybe uh, develop more, uh, more reliable predictive tool in that sense. So the message here is to try and do as many measurements as possible, not by us only, but uh, this is a call for the entire community because the more data we collect eventually the more accurate um, tool we can develop for uh, predicting lifetime and in order to uh, try and uh, join the forces we have this um, hub let's say uh, created on a website called plasticwaterworlddikes.org where we both uploaded all the literature data that I've been talking about today and it's, uh, we created a rather easy tools that can be used to play around with the data, filter it in the way you wish, and, and look at different, different patterns, different distributions, clusters of data. Um, the website also, the, 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 pro, um, the page also allows to uplay, upload your own data uh, if you want it to be in the database, and if you want to compare it to, the, to other data. So, um, so if we try and all together work and develop this database and make it much larger, eventually we can together create a lifetime prediction tool that will give us some good insights into uh, uh, stability of many years lasting devices by uh, some accelerated tests. So just to conclude, uh, first of all, um, a few recommendations. Um, I've seen some reports where people refer to ISIS protocols uh, as the test they did uh, for their samples, uh, but they claim the samples to be tested in inert atmosphere or, um, or using low UV light tests. Now, it is very important that to understand that these are not ISIS guidelines. ISIS guidelines are for air tests, um, so do not use inert atmosphere if you want to uh, refer to ISIS protocols. And it's important also not to use the UV, low UV light because this will produce completely different results for your indoor weathering tests. Um, so um, also um, try and conduct aging measurements in as many different environments as possible. If you do dark measurements, combine it with outdoor or light measurements at least. Um, and try and use different geographic locations if you do outdoor measurements. Um, use as many samples as possible. The better statistics, the more reliable the data is. And, um, and use the baselines that I've been talking about to compare your data with the data that is available in the lit literature today. And just to uh, conclude regarding the lif lifetime, so as I've showed, they've been already reported up to two years stability in outdoor conditions. And that has been 
reported in 2015, um, so study started in 2013. So if we look at samples today, I think people are already measuring up to three, four years, but it's simply it has not been reported yet. And I w could safely assume that in a couple of years we'll have up to five to six years stability. So I think OPVs are at least as of today are ready for some <coughs> excuse me, um, some uh, demonstration projects, some short-term uh, product um, applications, and in a very near future, maybe also already energy production applications. So with that, I would like to, of course, thank our um, um, funds and uh, our uh, solar cell group for all the work that has been done. I would like also to thank the cost action uh, groups that that contributed in analyzing all the literature data. And I would like to thank you for the attention and I, you have here and on the slide my email if you want to use or you have the questions regarding the database talked about, you'll feel free to contact me. Thank you.